Welcome everyone. Today I'm going to introduce Cartesian vectors to you and we're going to take a look at um, how to express Cartesian vectors, how to find their magnitude, how to express them in unit vector uh, notation, and we're going to do a little bit of converting between geometric and Cartesian vectors. So what is our Cartesian vector and why do we like them? Um, well, Essentially, Cartesian vectors are used uh, to translate our geometric concepts, which we learned in Unit 1, into algebraic form. This makes operations with these vectors easier and also allows us to plot them on an actual Cartesian plane. Um, so the way that we do that is with the notation where the vector has a tail at the point 0, 0 and a tip at some point AB. We write this vector with square brackets uh, using the coordinates of the tip. Um, so this is, and this is of course when our tail is at zero, zero. Um, we need to use the square brackets in order to kind of distinguish between the point AB and the actual vector AB. So let's take a look at what we mean here. If we want to draw the vector for negative six, we are going to start at zero, zero. And we're going to make sure that the tip ends at the point for negative six. So this is a Cartesian representation of that vector. Now, not basically like this is the way that we want to express the vector, but let's say that we translated this vector somewhere else on the graph, which is completely possible. We know with geometric vectors, we can kind of translate them anywhere and they'll still be equivalent as long as the magnitude and direction remain intact. So let's just say I take the point at zero, zero and I slide it left three and up two. Now I'm going to have it here. So one, two, three, one, two. I'm going to do the same thing with the tail one. Whoops not mean to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing with the tail here. So one, two, one, two, three, and there's my new vector. Now it's really the same vector, of course, because it has same direction and same magnitude, but it's somewhere else on the graph. So we're going to use this example as a way to kind of explain what comes next here. So let's take a look at where the tail of the vector is and where the tip of this vector is. This is at negative three, two, and one negative four. Now I want you to take a look at the individual components here. I have negative three and I have one. And I'm curious as to how we could get back to four using these two components. Well, if I kind of take a look at the difference between these two things, four and negative six here, I can get back by doing one minus negative three. And if I tried kind of like a similar calculation here, if I took negative four and subtract the tail component there too, I actually get back this negative six. So these points, regardless of where they are, actually always relate back to the vector components um, when they're arranged starting at zero, zero and ending at the tip, um, wherever that tip point ends up. Um, so from this, we can kind of see that we've done x of the tip minus x of the tail. And we've done y of the tip minus y of the tail. And this will always simplify to give us back the vector uh, that has the tail at 0, 0. And the tip ending at a particular point. So it always brings us back to this format here when we combine those two points. So that brings us to our formula to find a Cartesian vector between two points. If A is the tail and B is the tip, I can find vector AB by doing X of the tip minus X of the tail and the Y component of that by doing Y of the tip minus Y of the tail. Let's take a look at an example here. So if I have two points where two negative three is the tail and four one is the tip, or sorry, I think I said two negative three, negative two three. Um, here's our vector. Okay, so I can show you that this formula is true in two ways. Um, so I can actually show you graphically if we take the tail of this vector and shift it down to be at zero, zero. I'll go down three units and over two units, and that would give me the tail at zero, zero. And I have to do the same thing with the tip so that it stays uh, equivalent. So one, two, three one, two, and that's where my tip should end up. 
So if I translate this vector over to the position coming from the origin, you can see that this vector would be vector 6, negative 2, because it goes out to the point 6, negative 2. Okay, so let's look at this algebraically now. Um, the formula above says that if I want to find this vector, I'm going to do the x of the tip, which is 4, minus x of the tail, and then y of the tip minus y of the tail. And let's see if we also get 6, negative 2. And we do. So we can see in two ways here that this formula definitely does hold true. Okay, so we don't necessarily need to graph it in order to figure that out. As long as we know which one is the tail and which one is the tip, we can find the vector that connects them. So here we'll do x of the tip minus x of the tail and y of the tip minus y of the tail, and that gives us the vector 4, 10. Okay, so you can take a second and try out part C if you want to just uh, pause the video here. Uh, make sure you decide which one's the tip and which one's the tail when you're finding BA and vector AC. So hopefully you've tried this on your own, but uh, vector B is going to be your tail and vector A is going to be your tip. And similarly, this will be your tail in this situation and C will be your tip. So if I want to find vector BA, I am taking the tip components and minusing the tail components. So I'm doing A components minus B components here. And you should get negative 1, negative 4 for BA. And then AC, we're going to take tip components and minus tail components. So C components minus A components for this one. And you should get negative 3, 2 for this vector. So when we work with Cartesian vectors, we have these special vectors, which are called the unit vectors. Um, this is slightly different, kind of similar, but slightly different to what we talked about, like in geometric vectors, because these are these are still vectors with magnitude one. So similar to what we said as far as like find a unit vector in the same direction as vector V. We had questions like that in geometric vectors. Um, but these unit vectors, they are magnitude 1, they're just special unit vectors. And then I can also find unit vectors that are still in the same direction as any other particular vector. Um, but these guys are special unit vectors, they are vector i and vector j, and they are the vectors that go along the x and y axis and are one unit in length. So there's vector i, and this is vector j. Um, we also write these as like with little hats on them rather than vector symbols and that just kind of is to set them apart from other vectors um, and to show that they're special vectors. So we read these as i hat and j hat. So any vector can actually be broken down into a sum of its individual x and y components. And basically what we'll do is we'll use the x component as a scalar multiple of the unit vector on the x axis. And we'll use the y component of the vector as the scalar multiple of the vector on the y-axis. Sorry, I think I said y-axis twice. x-axis and y-axis. So as you can see here, vector AB can actually be uh, expanded out into its unit vectors, where A is a scalar of vector i and B is a scalar of vector j. So I'll show you what I mean in this example here. So let's take the vector OP, for instance. That's the vector here. Um, <clears throat> it has components 1 and 2. So visually, I'll just kind of show you, we need one I to kind of go over one unit, but we actually need two Js in order to get up to the tip of that vector. So basically how we will separate this out is we'll say that OP is equal to 1 times vector I, plus 2 times vector j. Now we don't really put 1 in front of something. Uh, we know that just from our math travels. So it's going to be i plus 2j. Okay, so we can see that algebraically and we can also see it visually on the Cartesian plane here. 
So similarly for Q, you can actually see that visibly that three eyes make up this vector. So we're basically just going to have three I. And if you have a zero Y component or X component, then you're just not going to put either the I or the J, depending on which one is zero. Okay, so I think we kind of have the hang of it here. This is going to be negative 4i minus j. And the last one will be 2i minus j. Okay, and then part b asks us to essentially do the opposite. Take the unit vectors and rewrite them back into component form. So here oa has a negative one in front of the i, that's the x component, and if you don't see the j component, that means the j component must be zero. Okay, coefficient in front of i is one, coefficient in front of j is five. And then same idea here. This is gonna be coefficient in front of i is the x component, coefficient in front of j is the y component. All right, so we talked a lot in geometric vectors about finding the magnitude and direction of vectors. Um, so the cool thing about Cartesian vectors is that when I write a Cartesian vector, it actually has magnitude and direction all together in one. That's also a reason why we love Cartesian vectors is that uh, we don't necessarily need to write explicitly the magnitude of the vector and the direction of the vector separately. When I state a vector in Cartesian format, it has both of those things. But if we did want to find the magnitude of a vector, uh, we can definitely do that. It involves using the x and y components of that vector. And then we'll use the uh, formula for the distance between two points. So uh, distance between two points, whoops. Distance between two points is typically found by doing x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So if we have a vector v, remember this is the vector v that starts with a tail at the origin and the head at point v, x, v, y. So the x component of v and the y component of v. So plugging that into this formula here, we actually get vx minus zero and vy minus zero, both squared and added. So we end up with this formula right here. Now, if you're finding the magnitude of a vector that connects two points, um, you can definitely use something like this. Um, but essentially, you'll see that the inside of this is basically what we talked about up here with doing the tip and tail components being subtracted so that uh, if you do that first then you can just kind of hop to uh, using this formula here okay so let's take the vector 7 4 for instance um, i want to show you how this is also connected to pythagorean theorem so we can see that vector v has seven units in the x direction and four units in the y direction. Now we know that, of course, x and y meet at a 90 degree angle. Um, so when we think about the magnitude of vector v, the magnitude of vector v squared will actually equal the other two sides added and squared. This comes from Pythagorean theorem. And if we were to square root here, this is essentially the formula that we talked about above. So you can kind of see how that's connected to Pythagorean theorem. Uh, if you ever forget the formula, basically you're just using Pythagorean theorem, plugging that in, and that's going to give you the magnitude of the vector. Okay, so here we're going to get 49 plus 16, and that gives us root 65. Um, we'll keep this in exact format wherever possible. Um, and if you can reduce the radical, then do so. But with 65, that's about as far as we can go. Okay, adding and subtracting vectors. Uh, this is the reason why we love Cartesian vectors is because it's super straightforward, super easy. If I wanna add vector V and vector U, I'm gonna add their X components and add their Y components. Uh, let's take a look at an example and see how this works on a Cartesian plane and also how it works algebraically. So vector V, this is at the starting at zero, zero and heading toward two, three. So there's our vector V. 
and vector u, negative 1, 5, that's this vector here. Okay, now we know I'm going to add vectors. If I want to do v plus u, I actually want those vectors to be added in a tip-to-tail method. So if I translate this vector over to be so that the tail of vector u actually starts where the tip of vector v ends, um, I'm basically going one, two, three units up and one, two units over. So three up, two over. So I have to do the same thing with the tip here. One, two, three units up and two over. And that's where the tip of vector u will end. Okay, so just translating that vector over here. Um, now I can actually find the sum of vector v and u. So this right here, when these guys are arranged tip to tail, will actually be v plus u. And we can see that the tip of that vector actually ends at the coordinate 1, 8. So I should expect when I add those components that I get v plus u is equal to the vector uh, 1, 8. So let's take a look. So 2 plus negative 1 and 3 plus 5 gives me, just as I suspected, 1, 8. Okay, and then similarly, we can do um, a subtraction between two vectors by taking the x components of the first vector and subtracting the x component of the second vector, and same thing with the y components. So let's take a look at this graphically, and then uh, we'll take a look algebraically. So 7, 4, here's our first vector, vector v, and 2, 6. That was not great. There we go. Much better. Okay, so just as a reminder back from geometric vectors, if I have a resultant which is equal to v minus u, if I rearrange this expression, the resultant that I draw actually has to be the vector that's added to u to make vector v the sum of those two vectors. So uh, if I do u plus the resultant, that needs to give me vector v. So essentially the resultant here is v minus u. Now if it were u minus v, it would be the same vector except in the opposite direction. Okay, so I should expect, now if I translate this vector down, I'd have to go 1, 2, have to go two left and six down. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm gonna do the same thing with the tip here. So we're gonna go two left and six down. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I should expect if I translate this over so that the tail is at the origin that I get out of my subtraction five negative two if I've done this correctly on the Cartesian plane here. So let's see if we do. Okay, and just as we can see on the Cartesian plane here, we do get five negative two for V minus U. So you don't always have to draw a picture, but I just want you guys to be able to visualize what's going on with this vector subtraction here. Okay, and just like we can uh, multiply any geometric vector by a scalar, we can also multiply Cartesian vectors um, by a scalar as well. And basically how we do that is we will just multiply that scalar by the x and y component of the vector. So you can see over on the right here, I have an example of a vector v, which has the coordinates uh, at the tip 7, 4. Now if I want to do 2v, I'm basically just going to take those coordinates and multiply them by 2. So we should get the vector 14, 8. And you can actually see visibly on here, so this is the first vector, 7, 4. And if I duplicate that vector so that I have uh, 2v, you can actually see that that vector ends at this point here, which is actually the point uh, 14, 8. So it's exactly what we would have, would have expected to happen if we double the length of vector v. 
Okay, and then directly from that, we can also determine if two vectors are collinear. So remember, uh, collinear means they are drawn on the same line. So essentially, they are parallel vectors. Um, <clears throat> and if they're scalar multiples of one another, that means that they're collinear. So the ratio between the x components of the vectors and the y components of the vectors will actually be equal. So let's take a look at an example here. Is vector u collinear with vector v? Well, I'm going to plug into this formula. So I'll take the x component of vector u and the x component of vector v and divide. And same thing with the y's. And then just simplifying here, we'll flip and multiply the bottom. And 3 and 3 cancel. We're left with negative 2 here. Uh, 5 and 5 cancel. And 12 divided by 6 is 2. So we're left with negative 2. So because these are equal, that does mean that they're collinear. This also gives us the scale factor uh, with how vector v is related to vector u. So we can actually see here that vector u is equal to negative 2 times vector v, and therefore they are collinear. All right, so we did mention earlier that um, we like... Uh, Cartesian because it's a little bit easier than geometric vectors. Um, so we still can solve geometric applications in Cartesian form, but we have to do a bit of a conversion first. So in order to understand the conversion, we need to remember the rectangular vector components lesson from uh, unit one. And that rectangular vector components lesson said that if I want to separate a vector out into its x direction and y direction, I can take the magnitude of that vector and multiply it by cos theta uh, to get the x component and similarly take the magnitude of the vector and multiply it by sine theta in order to get the y component. Um, theta is going to be the angle that uh, the vector makes with the positive x-axis rotating counterclockwise. So if you remember Back from when we did trigonometry we would kind of measure in this direction here with the castrol um, so that's going to be always the angle that i'm looking for so if i have a vector like over here i am going to be looking for theta to be this rotation right here okay so always measuring from that zero degree mark uh, going in a counterclockwise direction all right, so let's take a look at translating a geometric vector into Cartesian format. We're going to have, uh, well, a picture will be helpful here to start. We're going to have 500 meters at north, 10 degrees west. So it's going to give us something like this, let's say, where this is 10. And we know we want to measure from here. So I know that this is 90 degrees, which makes this... 100 degrees. That's going to be my theta. Um, what I really want to find is this coordinate. So that's actually going to be breaking this up into an x and y component here where I have kind of like a right angle triangle. So this x component is going to be equal to the magnitude of the vector times cos of theta. And the y component is going to be the magnitude of the vector times the sine of theta. Sorry, it's a little messy. Okay, remember our theta is 100 degrees as well. So our vector, let's say we just call this vector v, is basically going to be equal to 500, which is the magnitude of the vector, times cos of 100, and then 500 times sine of 100. Now, oftentimes we will, uh, if we're using this vector for an additional calculation, we might leave it in this format. Um, however, if we're not using it for anything, we can kind of approximate it. This would be the exact coordinate of the vector. Uh, these would be an approximate x and y coordinate for the vector. So you can have about negative 86... 
0.82 and about 492.40 is what it rounds to. So we'll just say 0.4 here. Um, this should make sense because we are in the second quadrant here, which means that we've actually gone left on the x-axis and up on the y-axis. So I should expect x to, be, x to be negative and y to be positive here. So um, sometimes if you calculate, that can also just help give you some confidence that the answer that you got is correct. So just to close up here, we're going to take a look at a classic geometric application and see if we can use Cartesian vectors uh, to help us with this. So So we have a ship and the course is set to travel at 23 kilometers per hour relative to the water or the current in other words on a heading of 40 degrees. This is a true bearing. And we have a current of 8 kilometers per hour and it's following a bearing of 160 degrees. We're going to write each of these as a Cartesian vector. So I'm just going to draw a little picture here so we have an idea of what's going on. Maybe make it a bit bigger. All right, so 40 degrees. And we know that this vector, I'm gonna say V with respect to C, velocity with respect to current, is 23 kilometers per hour. I'm just gonna bring that down a little bit here. Now, what we want in order to find the X and Y components to get to this specific point is I want theta inside here, which is going to be 50. So these, of course, add to 90 degrees. And the x component of my vector, uh, actually, we'll just do it together. So velocity with respect to the current, the x component of the vector is going to be equal to the magnitude times cos of theta, which is 50 in this case. And then the y component, same thing, but with sine. And that's going to be our velocity with respect to the current. Okay, I am going to use these for a calculation in the next part of this, so I'm just going to leave it in exact format here. Okay, now the current is 8 kilometers per hour, and it's flowing from, there's that word that we like, uh, a bearing of 160. So if this is kind of like your bearing of 160, it's actually flowing from that, which means that it's headed toward there. So if I just basically take this and kind of translate it up here, that's basically where it's going in terms of north, south, east, west. So I'm really looking for if this is 160, that makes this 20, and that makes this 20. So what I'm actually looking for here, I'm just going to erase these because we don't really need them anymore. Uh, what I'm actually looking for here is this rotation. And that's going to be 90 plus 20. So that's going to give me 110. Okay, and then I'm specifically looking for the Y and the X components here. And this is, let's label it, this is the current 8 kilometers per hour. So our current vector is going to be equal to the magnitude of the vector itself times the cos of the angle will be 110 and magnitude times the sine of the angle for the x and y components all right determine resultant velocity of the ship okay so just remember from last unit that velocity with respect to the current plus the current vector is actually going to equal the ground velocity and now that we have these as um, actual Cartesian vectors and we know how to add Cartesian vectors, this is actually uh, much, much easier than our typical ship or airplane type question. So all I'm really going to do here is I'm going to add the vectors x components above and I'm going to add their y components. And like I said earlier, this is actually going to give me a vector that contains magnitude and direction inside of it. Now, if we want to know the actual like speed and heading that we want to head, then we're going to have to do uh, the magnitude formula from above and just find 
uh, the direction. But this is much easier than uh, typically like creating diagrams and adding all of these things and so on. Um, so what we get um, approximately here, let's just use the approximation symbol, is 12.048. And about 25.137. So there is our ground velocity vector. So if I want to find the magnitude and the direction in terms of like an actual geometric answer here, I'm going to find the magnitude of vector uh, that represents ground velocity. And we know we can find the magnitude of that by simply taking the x and y components and squaring them. And then finding the square root. So you're going to get about 27.875 kilometers per hour when you enter this into your calculator. And then uh, I'm just gonna draw a little picture of kind of what this looks like. If I have a Cartesian plane here and I have a point at 1225, it's gonna be something maybe like this. So here's my resulting ground velocity vector where I have 12.048 and 25.137 and uh, because this original question gave me the direction as a true bearing I am actually going to aim to find this theta um, so if I create a right angle triangle here I can actually find that theta using these x and y components here so I'm going to use tan. So tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. And we'll just do tan inverse in our calculator here. So plug that into your calculator. And I think we should get about 25.6 degrees. So we can say that the resulting ground velocity <clears throat> is 27.875 kilometers per hour at a bearing of 25.6 degrees. Okay, now oftentimes, um, if we are dealing with a question like this, sometimes it may ask you just to find the actual Cartesian vector, which represents uh, the velocity. Um, but if we are starting with this type of information where we're given like bearings and kilometers, oftentimes we do want to answer in bearing notation and uh, actually tell the kilometer value. Um, but you can see if you kind of get a hang of how to switch these into Cartesian vectors, it makes finding that ground velocity much quicker and easier.